Great. Hello. Uh, I think we're ready to start. Uh, welcome, everyone. I hope uh, you had a very good fika um, and you managed to stretch a bit. Um, thanks for joining for the architecture panel uh, with uh, James, Mary, and Tomer. Uh, I'm super excited to have all of them on, st on the stage at the same time. And my idea is for, uh, obviously, for me to speak as little as possible and for them to have the word all the time. Uh, and I thought, or we thought, that it would be most interesting to discuss whatever you find most interesting. And so there's this uh, place called Slido. If you go to slido.com, you put in the code V603, you can write in new questions and you can upvote existing questions. I would very much encourage you to do, to do both. Um, and then we're just going to take them in the order of preference uh, after some very short intro. Uh, so I thought that we could start with uh, just a short introduction to yeah who everybody is, uh, where you work, what your role is, what you're excited about when it comes to software development. So uh, hello, I'm James Lewis. I'm a technology director at ThoughtWorks. I've no idea what that means either. Uh, <laughs> I've been there about 14 years now. Um, uh, I've been writing code for uh, professionally, I guess, for over 20 years. And uh, these days, I spend most of my time to be honest, advising sort of uh, on technology strategy and things like that. Don't write so much code at the coalface, have to do that either for pet projects or in Factorio, which is an amazing game if you haven't played it. <laughs> oh, and I'm, I'm interested in really boring things, uh, like the legacy apocalypse, basically. So um, most big organizations are facing a, a massive legacy problem. So how to unpick that is pretty much at the top of my mind most of the time. Nice, thanks. Hi everybody, um, my name is Marianne Bellotti. I work for Auth0. I'm an engineering manager, which means my job is to make engineers bigger, stronger, faster, and more productive. <laughs> um, and, and then do performance reviews, which is the exact opposite of that goal. <laughs> <laughs> I run teams on the infrastructure plat platform side. Um, uh, my teams at Auth0 do the shared services that back our entire platform. And the thing, I'm generally interested in most everything in technology. Uh, obviously, you listen to my whole keynote about my obsession with legacy technology, but I'm also really interested in um, what's going on now with like distributed systems and Internet of Things and like the few tiny, tiny use cases for blockchain that actually make sense against the 90% of use cases for blockchain that are snake oil sort of thing. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Tomo. Um, I'm a principal engineer for WeWork, and if you know what that means, I have a bridge to sell to you. Um, I've been doing professional software engineering for just shy of 20 years. Uh, consider myself kind of an amateur computer uh, historian. Uh, everything from old computers to old computer games. Uh, mostly do backend stuff um, because users are too precious to be uh, inundated with the results of my work. And uh, yeah, that's kind of it. It's <laughs> perfect, thanks. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, I had a question in mind, but uh, there seem to be actually plenty of questions up there. So I think that we could start with the first one, uh, which based on, uh, well, the, yeah, some of the introductions is probably going to be super interesting and on the keynote and on James's talk yesterday. <laughs> um, so best argument for monoliths as opposed to mindless microservice uh, trend following. And I guess that we can throw in modular monolith as well, if that would make any, if, the, if that would make any difference at all. Um, yeah, whoever would like to start. Um, okay, so the best argument for monoliths as opposed to mindless microservice trend following. Um, I have some qualms uh, with the, the wording of this question. I don't think it's uh, trend following. I don't think it's mindless. Um, I, would, I would summarize my argument in that monoliths are, uh, have been traditionally easier. I think that's changing. Um, I think the reasons why you might want to do a monolith instead of uh, you know some service oriented or, or domain oriented if you will uh, architectures are somewhat limited and somewhat going away I think it just has to do with the fact that microservices used to be that much harder to build and to work with uh, and that's uh, slowly changing not even that slowly and uh, in the same vein that 10 years ago you would or maybe 15 years ago, you'd have had to be nuts to uh, build your startup on top of someone's uh, infrastructure or cloud 
or whatever you want to call it. And nowadays you kind of have to either have a very good reason or be a complete idiot to want to build your startup based on servers you own in a data center. Uh, I think in 10 years you'd have to either have a very good reason or be completely nuts uh, to want to build your uh, stack on a traditional, what nowadays we might con call monolithic architecture. Um, so right. I don't think there are arguments for monoliths, uh, monoliths as much as the fact that right now it's still that much easier for new or small systems. Uh, until that changes, that would be the only uh, reason, really. And right. I don't think it's a trend and I don't think it's a buzzword. I think it's just the direction systems and system architecture has to go. All right, what would... Wow, Maria? the gauntlet has really been thrown on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a couple of thoughts on this topic. Uh, first, I actually kind of hate the term microservices because it's like, what is micro about uh, the service? And I think generally what happens in most um, software development teams is they break things out into services which start off small and then they add, add to the services and add to the services and then they have monoliths so that they have to break up again. Right. So uh, going back to this theme of my, my day which being cycles but what I, what I think it, about it is that monoliths are actually really highly effective ways to build things when you're first starting out and you have like a small dev team and everybody's working together because the code is all in the same place and it's easier to deploy and it's easier to collaborate. And then as you get well, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, if you find yourself in a situation where one part of your architecture is scaling up much faster and a much greater capacity than the rest of your architecture, then it does make sense to separate that out so that you can scale it independently. Right. Um, but there are all sorts of complications behind making that decision. And certainly it's something that you want to like think very deeply about and not just go monoliths, all monoliths must die. Let's kill them all right now. And you have to actually think about like, why is this worthwhile? This is a, a challenge that we're kind of exploring right now because we have a very kind of monolithic structure. And the argument from one part of engineering is we should separate these all into separate deploy pipelines. And like the, the argument from the other side of engineering is then when we want to make a change, instead of changing it in two different places in a code base in order to keep it all consistent, we have to change it in three different code bases and then coordinate all the deploys to production so that everything is in sync. So it really, there really are a lot of complications to like uh, going with a service-oriented architecture that you really have to think through very carefully. Right, James. Um, so I think, first of all, I'll address the name thing. Sorry about that, because I'm one of two people <laughs> who can claim to have named microservices, uh, myself and Fred George. Um, I think it's really, I, I'm a consultant, right? So the consultant's answer is it depends, right? You've got a set of requirements in front of you when you're trying to build something. And sometimes those requirements point you in the direction of building a distributed system. And sometimes those requirements point you in the direction of building something that's not a distributed system. Now, that's obviously a cop out, me saying that. Um, so I'll give you some examples, maybe. Um, one of the things that might point you in the direction of, uh, of building um, uh, uh, one thing at the start is if it's the first thing you're building. Um, I think we've seen a lot over the years that there's a quite a long um, runway that you need to sort of put in place uh, before you can successfully start deploying lots of microservices. So build pipelines as you're talking about, um, observability stuff, chaos engineering, all these kind of cool things. Um, and the danger is that when you start, you can spend all your engineering efforts actually building that runway, right? Um, you know, there's, there's the old quote, there's, there's no, it's no use having the perfect build pipeline if you've got no software to push through it. You're not make, making any, anyone um, any money or delivering any value. So, um, so I've, seen, I've seen teams start with monoliths very successfully. The problems I've seen with that, though, on the other side, is um, it becomes quite difficult unless you're in a pretty, I'd say, modern uh, engineering organization to convince people afterwards to split things up. Um, and that's more of a product management challenge and a product ownership challenge. Hey, but you've got this thing that's already working. Why do you not now want to split, spend money on splitting it up? Now you look at more modern organisations, and they'll 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 understand that software is never done. You know, software just has to evolve. And if one of the ways to evolve that software, as you've learned more, is to is to break it up, then you should do that. Um, but many organisations that I visit aren't so um, enlightened, should we say? So um, I'm rambling now. I'll stop. 
Um, I was going to say that I feel like you get to that point of like having to make that, that value add argument to the organization around doing something like either rewriting something or breaking something up eventually, no matter what structure you choose. At some point, you're going to have to change it in some way and you have to make that argument back to the organization. My, my question would be because you talk a lot about cycles and mm -hmm. sort of that at some point this is going to have to happen. Like what would you be, for example, like when you start with monoliths, how would you decide when is the time? Um, yeah. Like, what would be the indicators that you would be looking for? Like, what are the symptoms of monolith needed to be split? Yeah, um, I go back to scaling. Like, when, right. when you're seeing like huge, you're you're. Uh, I assume you're using like cloud, and you're you're rolling up like a bunch of different VMs. And when you're seeing like uh, suggestions that certain parts of your system are actually pushing that forward versus other parts of that system, like. There are companies that have a huge scale and still have monoliths. There was an article in Wired a short time ago that like Google's code base is a giant monolith, right? And like you don't get a larger scale than Google. So like you can run a monolith successfully at a large scale, but it really it's, if you have like an okay. uneven growth really it does start to make more sense to break it out into services so that you can like scale them appropriately for each part's needs. Um I would want to add um, just one statement, which is it is that much easier to start by figuring out what disparate parts of your app you have and build those up separately and to mitigate the cost of building those up separately, especially considering just how commoditized a lot of these tools are becoming. Um, if you reduce the cost, then you reduce the burden of building something as a, as a quote-unquote microservice-based architecture in the first place. Then again, the cost of splitting it up down the road, whatever impetus you have for doing that, which by the way I perceive to be organizational scale as opposed to technical or load-based scale, um, the cost and the complexity and the difficulty of doing that is to such a high degree higher, it's like orders of magnitude higher mm. than building it right in the first place. And I think the cost of building it right in the first place is dropping rapidly, whereas the cost of splitting it up uh, down the road when you start hitting those scale issues, again, whether it's technical scale or organizational scale, is so stupendously high that it just, it, to me, it's to my mind, it's a no-brainer which one you should pick. Right, James, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to clarify because I, I don't want people going away thinking James says build monoliths first. I don't, I, that's not what I'm saying. Um, I cannot actually remember the last project I was involved with or product build I was involved with that didn't start from some sort of distributed system. Um, and uh, just a comment on the Etsy's and the Google's who I don't think that's actually true at Google anymore. I think there's a lot of stuff that's now off their the, main deployment. Their actual structure is is not monolithic. It is their code base. So like the the all of their code is in one repository. I'm and it's just in the back so it is a monolith. So I think that was the thing that was lost in the wired article because they're like Google is a monolith as it turns out. And that's not it's the code base. But still like I think the impulse would have been to break it up into separate groups. And I also think they've spent tens of millions of dollars on really, really complicated build systems oh, and absolutely. testing infrastructure <laughs> to make that work, which most of us in the room don't have, so yeah. Right. <coughs> Perfect, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, I think we'll move on to the next one, which is examples of great architecture in open source and how to learn from them. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you have any thoughts on that or sort of yeah, particularly interesting open source projects, uh, efforts that should be maybe supported by all of us in the room, or who knows? I've got the mic. Um, so I guess there's two things to say. The first is, uh, so a good friend of mine, Adrian Cockcroft, when he was at Netflix years ago, uh, he introduced uh, the idea of the open Netflix open source stack. Um, and he, it was been, that's been very, very successful. I think everyone would acknowledge that. But he said it was quite interesting because when they started t talking to people about Netflix and saying, at Netflix and saying, we're going to open source your piece of this software, suddenly all the tests got written, suddenly it was well documented, suddenly right. it was refactored, and suddenly it was uh, turned into a nice piece of software. So um, that's the human side, the psychological side of open source. Um, in terms of a very specific open source uh, project, um, SiteMesh 3 is absolutely beautiful. So it was written by originally by a guy called Joe Warns, who's a former colleague of mine. He's now uh, was at Google and he's now somewhere else in, in, in San Francisco, or near San Francisco. Uh, but SiteMesh 3 is an open source project that, do you remember we used to do this thing called server-side rendering? 
<laughs> I don't know if you remember this server side rendering. It was like it was really cool. Like you had like, a server got a request, you like generated some HTML. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. And we should put web or like web server side rendering uh, or micro server side rendering and it'll be we'll, all, all the ways you go. But this was a tool that allowed you to do um, to essentially do page composition either client side or server side. Um, uh, and it was, it's just beautifully, beautifully written and beautifully architected. Beautiful piece of design. So yeah, Site Mesh 3, check it out. This is hard for me because I, I, I immediately think about it in terms of the organization of people more than the actual physical architecture of it. Like things like the Linux kernel and how they manage to like just just manage all of it. Like all the, the people who want to contribute to that and like how, how you like actually make that all work. Um, that's just fascinating to me. Um, but I would have to say in terms of like architecture uh, I gravitate towards D3JS, which I think if you're not familiar with it, it is essentially a visualization library, primarily to do charts, but you can do virtually anything with it. And um, that was the first piece of source code that I actually enjoyed reading because I learned a lot about JavaScript and like what you could do with JavaScript as a functional programming language from reading it. Um, and so like I'm just always, that's the thing I go back to when I think of beautiful, beautifully designed open source. Nice. Um, I'm having a bit of a hard time with this question because I'm not sure what architecture in an open source thing would be. Um, if I if I had to pick kind of a, a, a random decision on what that means, um, open source projects that I felt were uh, very well designed had terrific architecture, or even more so, um, are a layer of architecture that you can then take and plug into your own organization's architecture. I would pick uh, things like uh, Kafka, for instance, has uh, an extremely well thought out, uh, thought out architecture. And I never delved into the code base. It's just a very well rigidly defined mm. service that's pretty well implemented. And you can plug that in into various parts of your, your particular system's architecture. And in that respect, it's not only lovely, it's also extremely successful. Uh, another example might be Zookeeper, which is uh, something most of us don't actually get to use because it solves a very sort of low level architectural problem. And you generally use that to build larger systems, which to me is the essence of architecture. Um, any open source project that's, that solves a, a problem that's primitive enough and fundamental enough that you can use to build larger useful systems out of is already impressive. So those are two examples of that. But yeah, it's, it's a difficult question to, to reason about. Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, I totally agree because it seems like the ideas are almost always open source. That's sort of the nature of ideas and their applications then would be the examples that you talked about, like things that are beautifully designed using ideas that everybody has access to, but the application is so good that, yeah. I was just going to add about Kafka. <coughs> it is a marvelous piece of, piece of engineering, but then so is the transaction log inside Oracle or MySQL or PostgreSQL, right? I mean, I, 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 I do think it's quite amusing. Um, it's amusing to me, anyway, that um, that we're jumping on Kafka as this as this tool, which is essentially it's it's the guts of a database, and then we've got to build all the rest of it on top of ourselves, which is cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. no? Um, I'm just okay. really excited about this next question because so, I want to laugh right, out loud. Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, I know, I know. That's why I wanted to move on it as well. And I thought we could actually combine it with the third question that's on the screen right now because, like, to me, it seems like in the same ballpark of like how much would you lock yours because like when will Java die is a very fair question um, but it I think it boils down very much to how much people lock themselves into a specific language which is which might be to a large extent the reason why Java is still around um, and then I think that that very much uh, yeah relates to the third one which would be like vendor lock-ins uh, how much should you rely on one provider how much should you dis yeah can you use this opportunity to vent out some snork? <laughs> so I just can't help it. When will Java die? Oh, around the same time COBOL dies. <laughs> yeah, took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah, funny story. I found out recently that Perl still is a thriving community of people who are actively developing it. <laughs> which I was like, really? Perl? Is Perl coming back? Is that so? I, I don't think software languages ever, ever die. But as much as people may personally dislike one particular language, um, if it's being used effectively, 
why why should it die right so um vendor lock-in though hmm. i don't know do you have thoughts on java dying before we I think it's really unfair. Like Java's powered most of the internet or most of the web for the last like what fifteen years it is or something. Um, well, okay, whatever. PHP hasn't taken care of. And also, if you think about the challenges they faced actually um, writing, uh, developing that language and, and evolving that language over time, it's it's been an amazing journey that they've gone on. I have to. I think we should give them credit actually because um, you know if you think about backwards compatibility, I think. Like we're backwards compatible all the way back to the beginnings of Java. And there's billions of devices around the world, um, billions of program line, lines of code around the world running Java. So, you know, I think they've done a pretty fair job um, in, in 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 developing a language that's still still pretty usable. So I'm sorry if I if, if I disagree with anyone, but um, yeah, go Brian Getz and that crew. I think. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Take it. Um. You know, we're we're kind of skirting the vendor lock-in issue because uh, personally, I do feel that's kind of a separate uh, question. All right. Um, with respect to Java, uh, there's three things to say. One is there's Java the ecosystem or the the virtual machine, if you will, and there's Java the language. Uh, I am very much a fan of the former and very much not a fan of the latter, uh, which is why I ditched Sca uh, ditched Java for Scala what eight years ago. Um, I don't like Java the language, but who cares? Uh, it's useful, it's usable, it's being used. As for the platform in and of itself, if you eliminate Java, you eliminate the whole Android ecosystem, that's just not gonna happen. So Java is useful. Um, the JVM is amazing. Uh, the language has been evolving rapidly and, and making strides. The fact that I don't like it doesn't matter one iota to anyone, nor should it. Um, so. Yeah, Java is not going anywhere. Uh, neither is C, neither is COBOL. Uh, as long as it's useful, it's gonna be used. And right now, Java is probably more useful than it ever had been. It's not going anywhere. Good. Then we have answered that question. It yeah. never. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> also, uh, uh, like going, going into the vendor lock-in question, I feel like the, these questions are mainly motivated by a desire for technology for technology's sake. But this idea that if you are just clever enough, you will pick the right solution that's in the envelope at the end of uh, the quiz show and then never have to change your architecture or migrate or anything like that. And that's just not feasible. So in terms of like, if you're going serverless, you're going to lock yourself into a particular serverless provider's architecture. And if you build your own architecture, which I have worked with companies that have, you are still locking yourself in because you're going to look at that and the long-term expenses of maintaining that and like trying to keep it going. And then there's like, AWS's offerings get cheaper or Microsoft's offerings get cheaper. It doesn't matter the vendor. You're going to do that calculus again and think like, why do I continue to maintain this thing? Why not just migrate somewhere else? So there is no one right approach or answer or technology that's going to avoid all of the pains of eventually having to migrate somewhere else. You're going to, if you, what you are doing has a practical function, it will have to be changed at some point in its life cycle. And really the thing you should be focusing on is what is gonna give you the best bang for your buck in terms of achieving what you actually are building this technology to achieve in the first place at the current time within your current budget, given the resources that you have available to you. Right, so not choosing is a choice and there is no silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. So maybe I'll take a poll of the audience. Does it Anyone ever write SQL here? All right, so a lot of people write SQL. Um, was anyone ever forced to write ANSI SQL only because just in case we chose to move to a different database? Yeah, because I did. I was told by an organization you can only use ANSI SQL, you can't use T SQL, you can't do anything like that in case we shift from SQL Server to Oracle. Never happened. Never, ever happened. Um, so um, I. I think uh, unless you're in a super, super regulated environment where there are specific cases for compliance reasons that you have to be able to move mission, so things like core banking platforms, you have to be able to run them multi-cloud if you move into the cloud in certain, um, in certain parts and certain geographies. I think this is, yeah, I agree. Uh, I would want to add that um, the whole question of vendor locking, I feel, usually revolves around technology, and that's totally the wrong way of looking at it. 
The question is not whether you're locked into a vendor, because you kind of always are. If you're developing in Java, you're locked into the JVM space that's basically controlled by Oracle. So you're already vendor locked, even though there's multiple flavors of Java and multiple languages on top of it, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but you're already locked. The, the only real concern with vendor lock-in, assuming you have made that calculus uh, and you have made a, a conscious and conscientious decision on which vendor you're going with, is can you get your data out of there? If you can, you're not locked in. It just becomes a question of cost. If you can't get your data out of there, you shouldn't be there in the first place. So the whole question of vendor lock-in for my money is and always had been moot. And trying to answer it causes horrible things, not the least of which is, is having to write ANSI, like ANSI SQL, but also, uh, for instance, one of the great promises of ORM frameworks is, oh, you can switch a different database. No one does that. No one wants to do that. So who cares? <laughs> and cool. Uh, and, and often, yeah. even if you do the ORM, we'll give you the same value for each database that it says it supports in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> right, so make sure that you can get your data out of there uh, because you're going to have to do it at some point anyway. Uh, I think like the next question is uh, actually yeah, very different. Uh, that this is not a, a technology for or a question for looking for a silver bullet. Um, it's rather maybe a question fighting a silver bullet. So yeah, what would, what would that be? Uh, which I, I popular approach? I very much appreciate these audience questions because it's sort of like, please shit talk things so we can tweet this on the <laughs> internet. <laughs> 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 what popular approach is most overrated and why? Uh, I'm not, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but I feel like that's too, that's been here too long to, to be a worthwhile. I'm not a huge fan of Kubernetes, truthfully. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Kubernetes. Oh. Um, people keep trying to sell it uh, as like a really great thing. And I, I don't know, I just don't get it. So. <laughs> I'd go with, I, I would go with Kubernetes. I've seen people do things with it that seem completely contrary to what I understand as being its purpose. So for example, I've seen people try to put databases on Kubernetes and I'm like, mm, I think like that's not at all the point of orchestration actually. So I, I don't know, maybe I just have yet to see a particular organization do it super well so that I understand the value that it has versus other ways of like orchestrating and using containers. Um, but like I'm not sold completely. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'm going to get away with this. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so um, modern ETL, modern extract, Transform spot, load. Yeah. Well, I think we know it as like data pipelines yeah. and data engineering, right? Yeah. Um, because I, I, I think like this kind of world of data is the um, is the last refuge of the layered architecture. Um, we've sort of moved tend to tended to, try to to migrate away from layered architectures towards bounded context, main driven design, business capabilities. But we still have these layers underneath all these things that sort of suck in data or have like this bathtub with data drips into and then we, we have these, these data pipelines now rather than batch scripts that used to transform data. Um, there must be a better way of doing it. I don't know what it is, but we need to fix that, I think. All right, Kubernetes, ETL, or modern ETL, sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't know how uh, controversial it is at this point, but I would say um, it's not the correct terminology, but what most people consider to be dependency injection, actually inversion of control uh, for code, namely Spring, Juice, those types of containers, that's a terrible approach to designing software. Uh, the why of it is uh, pretty big. I have a, a whole talk that I gave ages ago, so that's like a 40 minute long uh, rant about inversion of control, but basically, uh, it saves you nothing, it causes nothing but a world of pain, and uh, <laughs> basically you're trading off, uh, trading off tapping on the keyboard, which is in, some, in, in a very real sense your job. Uh, you're trading that off with magic stuff that will get you in trouble down the road. So if anyone is interested in a, in a more detailed discussion of why, I'll be very happy to uh, talk about it later, link you to the talk I gave about this, but I feel that if you're using IOC, um, you're not realizing the benefit that you think you are, and very, very likely it will get you in trouble sooner or later. Right, so find somewhere if you'd like to discuss the pains. 
Uh, just an observation. Uh, the guy I mentioned earlier, Joe Warns, I think he said the best DI framework for Java was a constructor and the new keyword. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, thanks so much for this. Uh, so this has died, so I'll just use the phone. Um, the next most popular question was, what is the most climate-friendly approach uh, to architecture? And uh, uh, the most climate-friendly approach to architecture. Not building the damn thing in the first place. Right. <laughs> And if it has to be built? Oh, well, I mean, I had my snarky answer already to go. I don't know <laughs> what answer for that. Yeah, right. What's the most bug-free bug code is the code that has never been written. Uh, yeah. Yeah, to be honest, it's shockingly something I've never even thought about, which is terrifying, really, actually, thinking about that. Um, I guess you could make an argument that's being cloud native would be the most climate friendly on the basis that they, the, cl the cloud vendors are able to take advantage of economies of scale and optimize their data centers to the, to the, to the point that we can't. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess there's that perspective, but if I'm absolutely honest, um, this is something I need, to do, I need to do much more thinking about. All right. I'll echo James in that I never really uh, gave it that much thought. We are privileged in this industry to not really give a damn about resources that we consume because there's so much money going around and we get to play with toys and build big systems that don't need to be big. Uh, I would say that if um, economic or ecologic efficiency is the thing you're, um, you're aiming for, then you want to have as small a team as possible building the most efficient design possible for any given software, uh, which is a very roundabout way of saying hire a very small group of the very best people and have them do the very best job possible, utilizing the right data structures, utilizing the right storage, not uh, wasting a lot of money and carbon footprint on, you know, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. building something small on top of a huge cluster of machines and, and just wasting hardware and energy and all that stuff. Uh, which ideally is something you want to strive to in the first place. Uh, I don't think there's any, you know, just not doing stupid things is really the only way of, of saving up on energy and the ensuing carbon footprint. Um, if that were easy, we'd all be doing it. Right. It's not. So there you go. I'm going to add to that that I think it's actually a significant culture change for technology to become more eco-friendly. If you think about like these devices that we all have and like what it takes in terms of mining and resources to actually produce a device like this and how we've all bought into the idea that God forbid your device is more than two years old, right? And like, what, how do you dispose of it when it's done? It's like, this is beyond like, oh, well, what, kind of, what is the environmental impact of my data center and like, how do I buy the right carbon offsets? It's like, it really is like the technology industry is not, paying attention to this space at all and the impact it's having on it. We need the whole culture change of how we approach like hardware, software, everything. So I would say if you're concerned about it, just really think about whether the thing you are building actually needs to exist, whether it exists already in another form, because that's really the best way to like lower your carbon impact is not to do it at all. Mm. Yeah, I shouldn't laugh, but there's, there's a, um, so the, all the rare earths in our phones are kind of running out, that's a thing. Um, and instead of solving that problem of overconsumption of them, uh, there's five asteroid mining companies being formed, right? So it's like, <laughs> let's solve a completely different problem and go to space and mine asteroids for rare earths. It seems bonkers. Um, I do appreciate the mechanical sympathy thing there. I mean, it's not supposed to be product placement, but there's a great new uh, log management tool called Humio. Um, and they, for example, by being very, very close to the hardware, they will reduce the amount of hardware for log aggregation from by an order of magnitude from a typical elk stack. So they'll go from like 20 down to like a single single box. Now there's so there are very strong arguments I think for being very very close to the hardware. There's the old joke, isn't there, about um, you know Moore's law and software engineers doing software developers doing their best to eat up all the performance gains. Um, so yeah. Right. Uh, thanks. So yeah. Uh, thank you for. Uh, I think this is also to some extent a sign of, because the 
there was sort of a paucity of very specific suggestions, like the, because th this is a very wicked problem, uh, exactly as you've all said. Uh, and yeah, maybe this is a sort of a good nudge for all of us to sort of think more about what specifically can we do in the circumstances that we are in without having to like change everything, because changing everything is very hard. Um, I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, so. Um, I'll pick the, the one on the top. Um, your thoughts on functional versus orient, uh, object-oriented languages. And I think that the way that we could go about this would be like sort of what approach do you prefer and why that is, or if there is a specific language uh, that you actually prefer writing code in. I'll answer a different question and say Emacs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, down that rabbit hole, really? <laughs> that was pretty great, that was pretty great. Um, my friend used to say, and I really like this, I, and I don't think this is original to her, but I don't know who it was original to, that there's a lot of poop in oop. And uh, <laughs> I, I tend to lean on the more functional side of things over object-oriented. All right. Um, I, well, th that's a pretty loaded question in every sense of the word, but I think uh, one of the things most people that ask that question kind of forget to uh, preface it with is when you say functional programming, do you mean like, pure functional languages, the, the pure functional style of programming. And if you do, then which of the styles do you mean? Do you mean like closure style uh, management of state or do you mean monads or like which, which direction are you going in? Um, my answer to that is honestly pick and choose the things that make sense in either and just stick with them. Um, we as an industry have learned a lot about modularizing and organizing our code bases from object-oriented languages and code bases, and I wouldn't want to give that up. We as an industry have learned a lot from functional languages about the importance of, uh, say, mutability and persistent data structures. I wouldn't want to give that up. That being said, any technology choice, any language that has pure as a prefix to whatever it is that it purports to be is suspicious to me, and I wouldn't pick a pure functional language for any commercial uh, software product uh, for the simple expedient reason that I will have a very, very, very hard time explaining it to anyone who's not already an experienced pure functional developer. Um, that being said, there had been major products that have been written in every conceivable language under the sun, even PHP, and consequently just pick the thing you're most familiar with when you're bootstrapping your company and you won't regret it. Pick something new and shiny and you very likely will. So there's no right answer. Um, for me, as a, as a Scala uh, aficionado, I tend to, like, uh, the, the Scala ecosystem generally is, is perceived to be divided between people who do, like, functional programming in Scala or, or basically Haskell on the JVM in Scala and the ones that treat Scala as a better Java. I tend more to the latter category but then I'm also a huge proponent of simplicity and a lot of idioms from functional programming, again, especially immutability is a first class thing or immutable by default, if you will, um, and persistent data structures and a bunch of other stuff just make a lot of sense and they make your code simpler to reason about and, and simpler to extend, to build on, to, to maintain. Right. So I wouldn't want a pure language and then I wouldn't want to be forced into one or you know either of these two categories. It all depends on context. James, you had, yeah. That was the most Scala answer I'd ever heard that question. <laughs> you could do it in 15 different ways, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, all right, so no, no silver bullet again. Uh, we have uh, time for one last question, and we have roughly half a minute uh, per uh, panelist. Um, <laughs> My, my question would be, um, what is nobody asking? And we should be asking that. And like the climate question might actually be a perfect example of that. Uh, but would there be something that you feel like we should be discussing more? And yeah, we haven't asked that. Or we should be thinking about more. <laughs> <laughs> so the climate, the climate question was very good. Um, I, I've also been doing a lot of thinking around interdisciplinary engineering. So I've been teaching my back-end engineers um, the basics of user research and design because uh, um, about a year ago I had an interaction with a command line tool that was absolutely tr truly awful because it was mixing the GNU standards with the Windows X Windows standards and so it was like completely you had no idea how to anticipate what the great 
syntax for it was. And so I've been teaching them that because even though they build things that are traditionally considered to have no interfaces and therefore need no design, they actually do have interfaces. They're just interfaces that programmers use. And like that has been hugely beneficial to how we think about what we're building and who our customer is and like how we uh, uh, speed up adoption. And so I, I, I like this idea that as a profession, we should be going out and seeking other skill sets and other disciplines and trying to like bring those people into the conversation around technology mm. and see what we can learn from their, their mentality and their approaches. Right, so innovating across boundaries, sort of. I would say one thing we are not discussing enough and that we kind of need to discuss uh, as an industry is what is the ethos of being a, a professional software engineer? What are our responsibilities towards our customers, towards our users? What are the things we absolutely must do and must not do? Mm -hmm. So uh, ethics is one of the more kind of you know discussed issues that's sort of a subset of that. But I would say also, how do we as an industry grow up and start meeting schedules and start meeting budgets? What is it that we're doing that is uh, so fundamentally different that we can't really guarantee anything to our customers, whether they're sort of internal customers? Right. You know, why can't I promise my boss I'll be done with this or that in a couple of days and actually consistently meet that promise? Um, I think that has to do with the fact that we are a very, very young industry. We don't have a clue what we're doing. Um, we're learning what it is that we're doing and how to do that effectively and repeatably and reliably. And that's all the part of the industry growing up and we're nowhere near there. Uh, right. But also I think we're not having those discussions uh, almost at all and we need to start having them. All right, I'll throw the last uh, question to James. Uh, uh, those are really good answers, um, <laughs> and actually it's part of both, um, I think, uh, to, to add to that, maybe, um, I look around the room and you know, there's the elephant, it, we're, we're mostly old white guys in here, right, we need to do much, much better on diversity still, so I'm going to finish with that. Cool, all right, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, it was super interesting having you, uh, yeah, all, all, of, all three of you on stage. Uh, I'm sure... Uh, the, I'm sure you're all going to stick around. Uh, so if you want to throw some more questions at them, do it. Catch them around. Um, <laughs> thanks so much, James, Maria, and Tomer. Thanks for coming. Give a round of applause.